was a ruthless, relentless season. This is truly an eyeball here. A record-breaking barrage of storms. From a slow motion flooding disaster. It was terrifying to see these waters rising and not knowing what to do. To punishing winds and sledgehammer surge. Inconceivable in its magnitude. Hurricanes 2017, cruel and unusual. Unimaginable, unforgiving, unprecedented. And yes, cruel and unusual. Hello, I'm meteorologist Jim Cantori. It was the most active hurricane season since 2005. And for the first time on record, three Cat 4s in the same year slamming into the U.S. 17 named storms. It just didn't let up to have this many major hurricanes, this many huge impacts on the country. It was un unbelievable. One of, if not the most destructive and costly seasons, with damage estimates near $200 billion. Most of the damage came from three monsters. The first, Category 4 Harvey. It made landfall in Rockport, Texas on August 25th. The first Cat 3 or higher U.S. hit since Wilma in 2005. But that was soon dwarfed by what happened in Houston dire rainfall predictions came true. The aerial extent of the multiple feet of rainfall has changed the game in terms of what the benchmark is for a truly rain-making, disastrous tropical storm or hurricane. Now, it seems to have become commonplace for us to talk about how many feet of rain is the hurricane going to produce, not just how many inches. Houston is a very flat city on a coastal plain, and the clay underneath the city doesn't allow the water to percolate through it. But mostly, it's because they've paved it all over. This is a monstrous city that has grown and grown and grown. The water can't go into the ground, and it has to run off to somewhere else. This catastrophic flooding event was not limited to just Houston. Beaumont, Port Arthur, and Orange, Texas were also inundated. The National Weather Service tweeted, this event is unprecedented and all impacts are unknown beyond anything experienced. Then came Irma. It made landfall as a category five in Barbuda on September 6th, leaving the island completely uninhabited. Then moving on to the Virgin Islands and passing just north of Puerto Rico before taking aim at Florida. What we're dealing with in South Florida this morning Hurricane Irma, which right now are running 40 to 50 miles an hour, gust 60 to 70 miles an hour. Hurricane Irma was a category five hurricane that had on estimates 185 mile per hour winds for a record 37 hours. The Keys took the brunt of what Irma dished out in the continental United States. Those trees were bent sideways and it was just coming down, just nonstop relentless. Not one inch of the Florida Peninsula was unaffected. Then came Maria, doubling its wind speed in just 24 hours to become another Category 5. You can see what's coming you know, from our end, and we can do our best to communicate, but we can do nothing to prevent the situation. It hit Dominica as a Category 5, then made a beeline for the Virgin Islands in Puerto Rico, making landfall as a strong Cat 4 on September 20th. This stuff's coming off the roof. All of Puerto Rico lost electricity, and roughly a million people were without water. The mountain they are climbing is huge, but I, I haven't met one person that didn't feel that they were gonna reach that peak and go even higher, and that, that's amazing. Truly an amazing season. We endured every conceivable force that a hurricane can dish out. Saltwater flooding from storm surge, we saw that. The inland flooding from heavy rains, we definitely saw that. We absolutely saw just how damaging and deadly the winds of major hurricanes, including Cat 5s, can be when they make a direct hit. Hurricane Harvey will always be synonymous with Houston, dumping up to 52 inches of rain in the metro area and more than 60 inches not that far away. That's the most rainfall from any single storm in U.S. history. 
Harvey inundated up to 40,000 homes and left the area flooded with both water and tears. It's just tragic, it's so sad. I mean, my folks have lived here for 25, 30 years. With the help of a neighbor, Rick Roberts went by boat to see firsthand what was left of his parents' home and found this. His parents had left everything behind. Water's never come within uh, 100 yards of this house and started rising so fast that it, it really became uh, a get out now type situation. They only had minutes to leave. Freshly baked biscuits left buttered on the stove. They were evacuated to the south side of the bio and they're not gonna be moving back for quite a while. Knee deep in water, a heartbreaking experience. See what we can salvage? Really just things that have emotional value like old Bibles, maybe some jewelry. For many, like Maika Laverne, their first visits back were for a different type of treasure. We're going to go try to save my cat, Angel. When I left, I never knew none of this was gonna happen. This is not a flood area. They released the water over here. Kitty, 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 kitty. Maybe when the water came in, um, maybe it pushed my closet door open. So she's up high on my closet. So that's just the only thing that I'm hoping for. Him. You found her? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. I'm hoping he got out as the water began to rise. That's pretty resourceful that way, but uh, I didn't find anything inside. I lost everything. Everything's in there. Everything. I don't have anything. Amazingly, Angel was found safe the next day, and she and Maika moved to a new home. It's a different story for Rick Roberts' parents. Staying forever. This is just a once-in-a-lifetime event. There are a lot of memories in here, so I'm, I'm glad I was able to come in here on their behalf so that they didn't have to. This was ground zero for Hurricane Irma, blasting the Florida Keys just 16 days after Harvey. Kudjo Key and right here in Big Pine Key bore the brunt, enduring devastating storm surge and leaving lives in limbo. Home is said to be the starting place of love, hope, and dreams. But for some, those dreams were shattered by a horrific house call. Everything that we've worked so hard for is gone and destroyed. Sandra Suarez and Steven Valero had high hopes for the home they rented with their five young children. You know, we got satellite imagery. We're like, oh, it couldn't be too bad. You know, the roof's there, everything's together. Looks pretty good. Man, when you get here, it's just unbelievable, man. So, you guys, this is my house. <laughs> you just go numb. You go numb and you just say, I really hope that maybe it's just the kitchen and I hope it's just the living room and it's uh, fixable. William Bennett wrote, home is the shelter from storms, all sorts of storms. But this storm proved to be too much for this home. And here is pretty much what's left of, you know, our daughter's room. She's the RT1, she, you know, you see all the little pictures, just drawings she does on the walls and stuff. You know, we usually always have her friends come over. Everybody always comes here to hang out. And now we don't got nowhere for it. You know, our boys room, we just refinished the whole entire room. You know, trying to make it look nice. All this devastation coming at a time when the couple thought they were finally seeing their hard work pay off. I mean, man, we've been here four years. It's been a long time. It's pretty tough to see everything like this. We have five little kids and nowhere to go now, so. Hopefully somebody can help us. I mean, everything in our entire house is destroyed. Everything. Irma destroyed almost 700 homes and businesses in the Florida Keys. Coming up, a mind-boggling look at the 20 trillion gallons of water from Harvey. And later, the psyche after the storm. One of my regulars walked in and grabbed me and started hugging me and crying and said, I lost it all. Said, what do you say? What do you say? There's, there's nothing to say. You know, the, the sad part went, came early, why us? We got over that quickly. Tough times don't last, tough people do. When it comes to Hurricane Harvey, we're not talking inches of water. We're talking unfathomable feet. 
For many, it felt like it would just never stop raining. And when it finally ended, the widespread flooding was beyond imagination. Houses, or worse, their roofs became islands. About 50,000 had to be rescued. Six million dealt with 20 inches or more of rain. Almost five and a half million saw 30 plus inches. Houston saw five straight days of rain, generating more than a trillion gallons of water just in the metro area. It was terrifying to see these waters rising and not knowing what to do, and there's not a way to really get out. It's unimaginable to try and wrap your head around how much water that actually is. Well, here's hurricane specialist Dr. Greg Postel to put all that precipitation into perspective. Parts of Texas and Louisiana were inundated with feet of rain in only a few days. Some locations saw a staggering 60 inches, and that's 10 inches more than Houston's average annual rainfall. In total, about 20 trillion gallons of water fell over Texas and Louisiana. To provide some context, we'll look at these, a stack of pennies. If you were to cover the entire continental United States with these, a stack of six pennies is how high all of that water would be. And if all of that were to be concentrated in the state of Texas, that water would be ankle deep at just over four inches. But of course, what made this flood so devastating is that all of the water fell over an area affecting millions. Houston is the fourth most populated city in the US. And if all that water fell as one giant raindrop, that sphere of water would measure three and a quarter miles across. But perhaps the most mind boggling way to think about 20 trillion gallons is a running faucet. Just how long do you think it would take to empty out this giant raindrop? Try 19 million years. Before Harvey unleashed its torrent of historic rain, it made landfall as a category four hurricane in Rockport, Texas, becoming the first four to hit the US in 4,763 days. Not since Charlie in 2004. I was in hard hit Rockport in Port Aransas and witnessed extensive damage firsthand, places quickly overshadowed by the catastrophic flooding in Houston. Next we have Amelia Franklin. It's a scene played out in high schools across the country. Homecoming. But for Rockport Fulton High School, this is different. We still have challenges that we face, and we still have kids that are struggling every day. It's really nice to be able to come together like this and to just to celebrate being here, being all together here. The high school was severely damaged, as were many of the students' homes. It was heartbreaking driving through town, seeing all of the concrete slabs where the buildings used to be. It's not really home, but it's home. But homecoming seems to have an ability to heal. This is pretty much as normal as it can get on, on a Friday in Texas football. Having people in the stands, homecoming, I mean, it's just great. Our community spirit is unbreakable. It's, it's, it's uh, incredible. We've had a wonderful revival of community, of neighborhoods, friends, family, all pitching in to help. This sentiment seems to be the go-to mode for Texans. It was, man, it was a rough 48 hours not knowing what the future held. I mean, this is my livelihood. I, I put everything into this building and this town to, to you know, support my family, support my employees. People were pitching in, like Port Aransas restaurant owner, Billy Joe Wilson. I don't know how to swing a hammer, but I know how to flip a spatula. And, you know, I was like, let's start cooking. Let's start feeding everybody. People are going to need to eat and people are going to need to take oh, yeah, a break. I'm saying, finish making the mash and then we'll get those in the fryer. I think the hardest part was when we started feeding people, one of my regulars walked in and grabbed me and started hugging me and crying and said, I lost it all. What do you say? What do you say? There's, there's nothing to say other than, brother, I got your back. And that's, and that's what I'm trying to do and that's what we're all trying to do. And that spirit of Texas was in no short supply at Rockport Fulton High. We have, we've had a bunch of ups and downs, you know, a bunch of them. 
and uh, if I had a bunch of kids that didn't, that didn't make it back, you know, that, that got displaced, but I'm very proud of my boys. It's estimated that 35% of Rockport was destroyed and about 75% of the homes in Port Aransas were damaged or destroyed. When we come back, how Hurricane Maria left Puerto Rico powerless. We're sleeping on the ground with nothing, me and my wife. We take off all our clothes, all everything that we own. We got nothing. And later, the powerless feeling after Irma's intrusion. They use the term overwhelming, but uh, it, it really is. You just got to go forward with it. You just got to make it happen. If this avenue doesn't work, take another turn. Puerto Rico and many other Caribbean islands took it on the chin, not once, but twice during this cruel and unusual season. They were still reeling from Irma's devastating blow when Hurricane Maria just unloaded on them. Irma was merciless, hitting Barbuda as a Category 5, with wind gusts more than 200 miles per hour, leaving it in ruin. Then moving to the French and Dutch island of St. Martin, as well as St. Bart. 95% of those islands demolished. But Irma wasn't done. It passed just north of Puerto Rico, killing one and leaving more than a million in the dark on an island of 3.5 million U.S. citizens. Then Maria shook them to their core, a human tragedy that will take years to overcome. Meteorologist Paul Goodlow rode out the storm in San Juan and spent time visiting some of the hardest hit areas. Wind gusts easily in excess of two, 90 miles per hour. He said that he was sitting here and the wind just blew and blew and they felt it was like 185 to 190 miles per hour. This one is like nothing else before, never seen before. It was real strong and dangerous, a lot dangerous. Carlos Diaz lives in Yabacoa. He was home when Hurricane Maria made landfall in his community. But when you open the door, all the light poles were broken down, all the cables, all the sink, all, all the everything, everything was all over. Weeks after, he was back operating his small food stand. No, we still have no water, no electricity. I'm working with a little generator from 7 to 3.30, then go to the big lines of, to get some fuel. Well, the next morning, do the same thing all over again. I been, I, I make $20 a day, and I spend $19 in, in fuel. But we got to still do it. We got to give the service to the people. Even those who have lost so much still want to help others, including the 300 staff members of the Boys and Girls Club of Puerto Rico. From day one, despite their personal losses, they came to the job and just to make sure that we, that together we recover our communities. The club became a second home, providing meals, education, even a refuge from the struggles of daily life. You know, I didn't expect this level of damage and how the island was in such a state of crisis. So it's kind of overwhelming, you know, and then spending three months without electricity, about one and a half months without water. At least the second day after the hurricane, I felt very destroyed inside because, you know, you see everything. But then you think, like, how can I help? How can I make this better? People who were more, like, proud, oh, I have this, I have that, are more humble. Helping each other, helping other people. Agent Mickey Hohol with Customs and Border Protection Air and Marine Operations was one of the first to provide relief after the hurricane. Usually this island is a lush green island, beautiful, surrounded by nice, clear blue waters and flying around the island today uh, as you can see it looks like a war zone it literally looks like an atomic bomb went off it should be right down here we're looking for the uh, more critical areas right now on this trip taking much needed supplies to mountainous areas only accessible by air you can see as we flew in uh, a couple of bridges are completely washed away uh, we're in a really rural area the only food they're really getting right now is what we're bringing in no, we don't have any water and any electricity at all. 
when we saw the farm, everything was lost. The bananas, the plantains, the everything. We're sleeping in the ground with nothing. Me and my wife, we take off all our clothes, all everything that we own. We got nothing. But it's not easy. And I know if the whole Puerto Rico is in the same situation. Still, hope remains. It's going to be a long time to get a lot of things up. It's the truth. When we get it up, we're going to start again with the same Puerto Rico with almost better. People are tired, but we're willing to do the work. We love what we do. And when you get to go out there and you see people's faces that we are helping, you can't ask for anything better. Coming up on Hurricanes 2017, cruel and unusual. An eye for an eye. I get scared every time I go out to film. I have to be pushed out the door, I think. And later, finding strength in the stars. It's a symbol of unity. It's, it keeps us going. Welcome back. It was a hyperactive season the most major hurricane since 2005, and incredibly 10 straight named storms that all became hurricanes. Undoubtedly, 2017 goes down in the record books as one of the most destructive seasons of all time. Destructive and deadly. Six category three or higher hurricanes. We haven't seen this many since 2005, including Cat 4 Harvey. You know, when you look at how many homes flooded in Texas because of Harvey, how much Harvey will cost. That much water caused the city to sink almost an inch, according to the National Weather Service. Right on its heels, Irma. Irma made landfalls a Cat 5, a Cat 4, and a Cat 3. Same storm. You look at the millions and millions and millions of people lost power in Florida. The biggest Florida power outage the state's ever seen from Irma. Hurricane Maria reached category five strength as well, wiping out Dominica, the strongest hurricane on record to hit the island. Nate was an interesting tropical cyclone as it raced northward at record speed across the Gulf of Mexico. That record, 28 miles per hour. So Nate literally came and went, making landfall as a hurricane along the Gulf Coast. First in Southeast Louisiana, then again in Biloxi, Mississippi. Rounding out the record season, Ophelia. We had a hurricane in late October in the North Atlantic making landfall over the UK. It was the 10th consecutive tropical cyclone in the Atlantic Basin to reach hurricane strength. So when people say, seems like everything became a hurricane this year, well, it's not too far from the truth. To say it was record breaking wouldn't almost do it justice because it was somehow beyond that big of a term. You need something bigger. Irma made landfall on Kudjo Key, right around the corner from here, and 20 miles north of Key West. No known storm on the planet has been as strong for so long, with winds of 185 miles per hour lasting for 37 hours. It's paradise lost in a place where the mindset is typically manana. But after Irma crashed the party in the Keys, tomorrow can't come soon enough. You know, they use the term overwhelming, but uh, it, it really is, and that the governor was overwhelmed, the politicians, the uh, commissioners, carpenters are over overwhelmed. There's not enough uh, to go around. But that's now the new normal for Jimmy Steffen and his wife Piper, who moved to the Keys just six months before Irma. Now for them, living the dream is more like living a nightmare. We found this out early when we came back. For every person that needs plumbing, there's uh, a thousand customers in, in, in the wait. And even plumbers have their own issues. Everybody that lives in this community was part of it. They had to fix their home, their family's homes. And that includes electricians, that includes um, wh whatever essential need that you had at that point. And not far from the Steffens home, longtime Keys local Stephen Ballou is encountering other obstacles. I don't even have an address. The, the, the post office got blown away. There's none of that UPS where they deliver your stuff to. I need to get boxes to ship, or not ship, but to box up my belongings that survived. As you see, we've gone to the uh, forced remodeling of, of uh, the open floor plan. The living arrangements 
it's glorified camping, if you will. We like to think that um, we're camping out with a $150 a day view. <laughs> we don't have it that bad. Some have it better, some have it worse. Everything is a logistical problem, or how do you do that? And the, the costs go up according to that. So you may think, I've got money to replace this building, but half that money goes to just hauling your debris out of the keys. You know, the, the sad part went, came early, why us? We got over that quickly. And um, Piper and I only know to go one way, and that's forward. And, and we do have a little saying. And that saying is, uh, tough times don't last, tough people do. And then the emotion went to, it's time to fix this because nobody's gonna come and save you. You just gotta go forward with it. You just gotta make it happen. If this avenue doesn't work, take another turn, try that avenue. Just keep going down that path. So for now, this is the path to get back to normal. Frustrating, tedious, costly, but in the end, worth it. It's amazing, it, it, you love it. I mean, every night, I'll take pictures every night of the sunsets. I take pictures of the sunrise every morning. It's beautiful. It's just gonna take a long time to get back to the, the magic of Key West. They call themselves extreme photographers, capturing weather at its worst, in the worst of it. Veteran storm trackers Jim Eds and Mike Tice share their incredible footage and unforgettable experiences from this remarkable season. This hurricane season was unlike any other hurricane season I've been in. Three Cat 4s, every one of them treacherous. Texas at Cat 4, Harvey, that was really scary because there was no safe place in Rockport, Texas. You were 10 feet above sea level, so the water was gonna get you or the wind was gonna get you. There was a certain snap to the wind. Hurricane Irma, we had over 120 mile an hour winds at our location. We witnessed these wind gusts coming off the water unobstructed and just plowing into the tropical palm trees and the buildings down in the lower keys. And on top of that, we had storm surge that affected both coastlines and it was just a major disaster down here. In Irma, one thing that we focused on was getting right on the coastline to get those winds coming directly off the water. And there's an area in Key West where the palm trees, this beautiful row of palm trees, was just getting blasted by winds over 100 miles per hour and just shredding the palm trees piece by piece. Uh, it was really intense, and then the storm surge started to come up. So we had to back up and get to a safer area, and that whole area just a half hour later was completely underwater. Irma lingered down there off the coast of Cuba and weakened slightly, otherwise it'd have been probably a Cat 5 and I'd have really been worried. But as it was that night, you could hear the uh, rafters under the roof, they were banging and clanging and, and it was scary, it was dark and you, you, you see 163 mile an hour winds on the top of radar, so you stay close to the, uh, to the house and you film and every now and then I'd go out and I'd say, I, I think I can get a shot here for about 20 seconds and I'd go out there and I'd get a little more gust and I'd say, oh, I gotta drop down because I don't want to get blown away, so I'd get down lay down and, uh, and shoot some more angles. Then the water started coming up the canals. It, it came in from the uh, Atlantic. It, it came up slowly, but once it covered the area, it, it came up pretty fast. When I went to Puerto Rico for Maria, I went to a resort right on the coastline, and I knew it was a safe location to stay and also document the elements. I was actually very elevated on a cliff on the edge of the water and filmed these intense winds just come right up the cliff and smash into the hotel. But we couldn't even go, I couldn't go outside at all and film because it was just way too dangerous of a situation, but I did document from the element of what it's like to ride it out inside a resort. And it was a very scary event. There was glass breaking, there was things flying, through the lobby. Maria in Puerto Rico, I went outside and I'm outside the, uh, the resort and everything starts coming off the roof. So it's all raining down debris. If you had three seconds, it'd come off the roof, you'd see it and then you could get out of the way. When I was driving up the Florida coast to get to Hurricane Nate, we went to Biloxi, Mississippi and the wind wasn't too intense, but the storm surge pushed straight up just like I thought it would, because I've seen that in Katrina. And it came into the, the lobby there of a casino, and it, and it you know, caused some problems at, to the areas that are right on the water because of the storm surge. So it was kind of a, a, an interesting ending to this really wild and crazy 2017 hurricane season. I get scared every time I go out to film. I have to be pushed out the door, I think. Uh, either film hurricanes or go back to the boring day jobs. So I'm going to stick with hurricanes. Still to come, the real hurricane heroes. 
and a look behind the curtain at how we cover hurricanes. Go ahead and frame up, stand by. All right, all right, how's that? One, two, three, four, five. Just trying to stand in that and the force of that wind. Being about the longest 15 minutes of my life. They always go above and beyond. First responders are true hurricane heroes. And with the seemingly endless barrage of storms in 2017, there wasn't time for a day off. Over and over, they risked their lives to save others, including the Customs and Border Protection agents that made hundreds of rescues. Our Dave Malkoff joined them on a mission in Texas. They've been on the, the roofs that they've been stranded for so long. Below us, the water is rising, flooding homes, entire neighborhoods really, in Port Arthur, Texas, 91 miles east of Houston. Watch as an aviation enforcement agent descends 41 feet on a cable to rescue a man named Dominique Herbert. It's been raining, raining, raining. Grandfather, great uncle, and others. I grabbed my phone and, and heard up and called my grandfather and let them know that they were outside and come, come and rescue me. What you are seeing is the view from our 360 camera mounted to a rescue basket. The man inside here has only the clothes on his back. The helicopter blew my stuff off the roof, my clothes and stuff off the roof. These helicopter teams often work to keep drugs off the streets. Today, there are no streets, only what look like rivers. The rain has just not stopped. And I'm just, just trying to get us out of here. We're lowering the hoist right now. Imagine this is your first helicopter ride ever. You've been stranded on your roof for hours and help finally comes, but it comes with roaring winds and strangers attaching you to some kind of metal device. You can see the distress and how tired they are. Even as we have that reunion going on here, we've got Another victim coming in here, another family member being pulled in on this basket. She's been on that roof for quite a while now, waiting for the helicopter to come save us. Now she's back with her family on board here. I'll take your keys. My son is an Eagle Scout, so he wants to go last. He wanted his dad to go first. Stafford Bernard is safe. So is his son, the Eagle Scout. He's the only person we've seen so far in chest waders. Look around us. There is a fleet of birds from several federal, state, and local agencies, all of them talking to each other and watching their six. That lady right there, she's 92 years old. She is not alone in seeing a Texas flood this widespread for the first time. That's by my count, more than 15 people rescued in this one CBP helicopter on one take of gas. Just enough time to get back to the airport refuel, and do it all over again. What you see on screen is just a fraction of what goes into our hurricane coverage. For example, during Irma, we had more than 60 people in the field at one time. Here's a behind the scenes glimpse of what we do. Go ahead and frame up, stand by. All right, all right, how's that? Yes, 15 seconds, 15. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, all right. There's this. This is meteorologist Mike Seidel back in Miami. As and then there's this. update you on dangerous Hurricane Irma. The weather was so bad, uh, the lightning was ferocious. We had to abandon the tent. Oh, wow. So you can see the tent has kind of just crushed itself. Oh, there's the other sandbag over there on the fence. Stepping out right here. Oh, it's all together. Can you better believe I am coming right back to the camera? 
it's flooding, it's coming up as fast as we talk, it's coming up. It's just, there's no place for us to go. We're surrounded by deep water. We are not taking any chances. We are turning around. You're watching TV and you think it's just a cool job. Very rarely eating when you want to eat or drink when you want to drink. The most important thing is safety. Too dangerous, all types of stuff from the roof flying out. It's just not safe to be outside again. Hard work. Brad, what are you doing? Just trying to gather up all this stuff and set up inside. Yeah. Too much debris. If I can reach behind your bread and grab my helmet. Again, we all, we all had our helmets on to protect us, but you know, it's also just uh, making a smart judgment call when you have stuff flying off the roof. I'm with you, man. I'm doing my best. Being in the eye wall of Hurricane Irma in Naples was one of the most physically taxing uh, things I've ever done. Just trying to stand in that and the force of that wind and then just a, a wind-driven rain that if I didn't even have eye protection on, I, I, I couldn't have even have been out there. Having the helmet on and the glasses saved me. That could end up being about the longest 15 minutes of my life. These are some of our cables also that didn't make it the other night. We just went live for the first time. From the field to the studio. You need to make sure that we have sight down, we have Bettis ready to go. It's coordinated chaos. Let me know if there's any problems. But no forgets why we're here. Power outages in Texas and Louisiana. When you're covering something as devastating as this, you're here and you're working and you're doing your job and you're thinking about all these people. What you're going through, is it close to what the people here in this tragedy are going through? And uh, we really think about these people a lot. Keep the faith, babe. God bless. God bless you. Always a wild ride in the field during hurricanes. When we come back, how much is climate change contributing to these supersized storms? To deny that there may be some connections is irresponsible. How many people are going to be on the front lines next time? How many lives lost? How many billions of dollars are we going to have to pay before we realize that we need to be proactive? It was a monster season, no doubt. And it's no secret that our oceans are warming and our sea levels are rising. But what role is this changing climate having on hurricanes? I think the questions about linkages to climate change are the fair questions to deny that there may be some connections is irresponsible. Most scientists agree that when it comes to hurricanes, more long-term data and better climate models are needed before definitive conclusions can be made. But there are signs. What we do need to do as a society is start connecting these dots and recognizing that this risk is there. It's a clear and present danger. During 2017, we had an Atlantic hurricane season with some of the warmest ocean temperatures on record. We saw with Hurricane Irma and many of the storms this season, long lasting intense storms. That's directly related to sea surface temperature. I think this is something going forward that is of concern and probably has a fingerprint or DNA to climate change because we know that 90 plus percent of the warming in our climate system is in the ocean. That intensification will translate into larger wind speeds. This is the fuel that we know is very, very important in hurricane strength in particular. And it's not just intensity tied to warming. One of the things we project with warmer oceans and a warmer atmosphere right over those oceans, this atmosphere can literally hold more water vapor. And so for any given precipitation event like Harvey, one that stalls and slows down, it's basically supercharging itself. In fact, a study by renowned hurricane expert and climate scientist Carrie Emanuel found that the likelihood of a Harvey-like rain event has increased sixfold since the late 20th century. Then, add in rising seas. Near Galveston, for example, water is rising more than two inches every decade. We know for a fact that sea level is rising, and in recent years, it's rising faster. That means that a Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Maria 
is shoving higher sea level onto a coastline than perhaps that same storm would have 50 or 100 years ago. How many people are going to be on the front lines next time? How many lives lost? How many billions of dollars are we going to have to pay before we realize that we need to be proactive in planning for our climate future, which is again our climate now? They symbolize vigilance, perseverance, and strength. And in the wake of natural disasters, they're often what brings hope or inspiration to those that need it most. That was certainly true in the aftermath of Harvey. It's a symbol of strength. It's a symbol of unity. It's, it keeps us going. We love our flag. We, we love the country and we love our neighbors. The day after Harvey made landfall, we're surveying the damage of the high school area there in Rockport. Completely demolished cinder blocks and all. And to see the campus demolished, wind and water damage inside, I look down on the ground and I see an American flag. I, I can't leave this here. It's still raining, there's debris all around it. The school, yeah, it's battered, so is the flag, but. We've got to fold this up, make sure this isn't a casualty to Hurricane Harvey. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking to myself, well, do I kind of fold it up in like a rectangle? And I'm like, no, no, no. It just came to me years ago. I was a Boy Scout, and I remembered you got to fold it in triangles. Even though I could see that the flag was kind of torn and tattered, we folded it up. Not the perfect fold, but definitely a, a rescue from Hurricane Harvey here in Rockport. On the same day the school raised a new flag, we made a special delivery. I want to present this to you on behalf of the Weather Channel. Everything we do is for this, to see you guys recover. And I wanted this to be a sign of Rockport Fulton High School rising after Hurricane Harvey. Pirate strong. Pirate strong, Paul. We do thank you for coming and protecting and saving our flag. It's a symbol of a great country, but it's a symbol of hope for us here in the Rockport community too. As we say goodbye, we say good riddance to the incredibly cruel and unusual 2017 hurricane season. Here's hoping we don't see another one like this anytime soon. I'm meteorologist Jim Cantori. Thanks for watching.